Hi everyone. We're going to continue our look at art mediums. We've studied drawing and painting so far. We're going to look at printmaking today. The next lecture we will look at photography and film. Then we will go to sculpture and architecture. So let's get into printmaking. Now when we think about printmaking, I don't actually start with the print here. I start with something in between painting and printmaking. Let me show you what printmaking is, and then let's come back to stencils. So in printmaking, you have a matrix, and then from that matrix, you're able to make multiples from it. And the matrix can be done in a number of different ways. It can be made out of copper. It can be made from a screen. It could be made in a computer program. And the earliest prints are made probably from wood block printing. And it's a principle kind of similar to muddy shoes, where when you get mud on the shoes, you might track a full footprint of mud onto the floor. And then as you continue to walk, there would be less mud in your shoe and it wouldn't give you a full print anymore. So early on in printmaking, we get woodcut prints around 860 something AD. We have the first date, the, the Diamond Sutra, uh, which is a, uh, a little scroll about Buddhism, is the earliest dated woodcut print. The printing press, and we're seeing kind of the effect of the printing press here, is invented by Johann Gutenberg in 1455. This is the beginning of bookmaking. So when you're working in a print like this, you have raised letters. The letters are backwards. Let me show you a little bit what this looks like here. So here we have what a printing press would look like, modified by Gutenberg for making books. And the press was made from, modified from a machine to squeeze the juice out of grapes. And then he modified the press to make sure that it had an even amount of pressure, which you use by pulling this giant wooden lever here. You have somebody who has made the letters. The letters are cut out of lead, and then they're raised, and then they would be inked. And then you would ink every pressing to ensure that you get a good even pressing on it. The very first book printed is the Gutenberg Bible. It is a Bible printed in Germany by Johann Gutenberg. It took several years to make, printed on vellum. It has leather book covers, and there are only a handful of these left in the country. One of them is in Southern California at the Huntington Library in Pasadena. It's pretty magnificent and I recommend seeing it. So the printing press is based on then this idea of relief printing where you cut into wood or could be a linoleum cut and then the inking is happening on the top on the raised areas. And this would be different than engraving and intaglio processes where you put the ink into the grooves and you kind of squeeze the ink out. In lithography, this is more of a direct way of printing by drawing on a stone and then using water and oil-based inks that repel each other to get a print. We also have screen printing where you burn an image into a screen and then you put that screen onto a surface. It could be a t-shirt, it could be a piece of paper, it could be a canvas. And then you kind of run the ink over it in a nice even fashion to get a reproduction. And then of course today we have digital inkjet printing. And I have a video that shows you how the inkjet printer works. Um, I might not show that today because it's, it's a kind of long and you got to really kind of be into the science of it. So again, with printing, you have a matrix and then you get these prints from it. And depending on how solid your matrix is, like lead letters, you could get tens, maybe hundreds of thousands of prints. Something like, say, linoleum or linocut, it cuts a little bit easier, it's softer than wood, 
but it also, the more you print it, it prints the image right out of it. Okay, back to stencils. So where are stencils in this? And this is an opportunity to talk about Banksy, who is probably one of the most popular of the street artists in my lifetime, at least. So painting is the art of generally making one of a kind. Same thing in drawing. With printmaking, it's a way for an artist to make one impression, one matrix, and then to do it over and over and to sell them cheaper than the original and potentially make even more money doing it. In stencils, you're using a lot of times spray paint or enamel or aerosol, and then you're making a matrix that is usually one of a kind and maybe you're gonna get one usage out of it. I am guessing that from what I've seen, the stencils that Banksy uses look like they're made out of paper or very thin cardboard. And I'm guessing that a stencil like the Mona Lisa with an RPG with the Banksy signature vertically, I'm guessing that this might be two to three different stencils that would be quickly taped up on the wall and then once it's taped up, you just spray over it as fast as you can. And you could probably get one of these up, I'm guessing, in 45 seconds to a couple minutes tops. Uh, which means that you're less likely to get caught. Whereas if you were painting this carefully on a wall without using the stencil, it could take you a lot more time, which increases your chances of getting caught. Not a lot of uh, is known about Banksy, for sure. There's some speculation on who he is. We believe he's from Great Britain, possibly from Manchester, and then everything else is kind of up in the air. But he's been doing these stencils for a long time. I want to show you a couple of things that Banksy has done that I think is kind of interesting. So this is a video that shows some of his stencil work. And he's generally working with black paint, but he also will work with stencils that are white and black as well when he needs to. I would guess on these white walls, it's just one black stencil. Sometimes then he adds in things hand done, like the I love you is probably hand done. Um, the peace and love sign are probably hand done and a little bit crooked. Uh, the uh, Jeff Koons dog. I'm guessing that the rat, the rat city does, I think are always stencils. Will work for idiots is hand painted, and then it looks like a stencil that is white and um, black. The, the previous one we saw also had a flesh color in it too. Looks like he hand did Banksy, white. So you can kind of get an idea. These are what some of his stencils are. He's generally kind of politically active in what he does. This is really interesting to me. So Banksy's artwork, some people now will take the wall apart that he paints on and then try to sell the wall. Part of what he's doing is about kind of trying to defeat the paintings being sold for money. Now in this case, he made a stencil that he had done, oh, a lot of times. Uh, the girl with the balloon here. Uh, the balloon is a red stencil, and then the girl is, I think, a black stencil on white paper. He put it into a frame, and then it sold at auction. Art connoisseurs could only watch in horror as an expensive piece was shredded before their eyes. No sooner did the gavel come down. So you're talking about $1.4 million for this painting. And then as it sold, Banksy, kind of anticipating that this would be sold, he built a shredder into the back of the painting. Shredder has X-Acto knives, and then it was supposed to shred the entire painting, but only shredded part of it. I love the woman on the phone here watching this happen. And then the interesting question is, is now that the painting that you bid it on for $1.4 million. Now that it has been destroyed, do you keep the painting or do you demand your money back? And I believe they kept it with the idea that 
You know what? There might be a number of Banksy's out there, but there's only one shredded Banksy, and it made it probably more valuable. Banksy also began doing these residencies where he would either work himself in New York, and for 30 days in New York, he made different art pieces, and Dismaland, stay out. Welcome to Dismaland. Enjoy. One he says that sends a more appropriate message to the next generation. Sorry, kids. So this is a pop-up show. I think it lasted for just a few weeks. He had a number of different artists uh, work with him. I don't know how many of those artists, again, know his real identity. One of the things I suspect, though, is that so many people have probably worked with Banksy. The fact that nobody has turned in his secret identity leads me to believe that Banksy must be a pretty good dude. He must, there, he must be all right. So this show, we've got other artists doing things like um, skits from British television shows. There's sculptures. This is the painter Jeffrey Gillette. He is an artist in Orange County. Who's been subverting Disney for years from his home in California. And I see it as kind of an absurd little teeny pocket of fantasy. And then the rest of the world is a different story. And what I do is I try to find the absolute opposite of the happiest place on earth. And I'm a natural born pessimist. And I'm thinking, well, I've been a pessimist for 30 years, 40 years. And it hasn't gotten that bad, but it seems like it's just kind of ramping up. I don't know what's going on in the world, and it's scaring the hell out of me. That's the Home Secretary giving a press conference. And then the entire... So, you know, there's a miniature golf game where you lose your ball. Uh, if kids need to borrow money, they can borrow money at 5,000% um, uh, interest. And then it culminates in this Disney-esque castle where you see a kind of Disney disaster happening where the Disney princess and her pumpkin chariot has uh, collapsed, killing the princess, very similar to Princess Diana. And then the very end of the Banksy exhibit, you exit through the gift shop. And that was a documentary that was done by Banksy that won an Academy Award. So that's a little bit of Banksy there. The other thing that I have on Banksy that you might find interesting is I have images from the New York residency that he did in 2013, where he announced that he would be putting up a piece of street art every day for 30 days, including sculptures. One of my favorite things is it was a venue with an old man sitting at it selling little stencil paintings for $60. And if you had a good eye, you realize that those were Banksy's. And I am sure the value of those is much, much more than $60 probably at this point. So, again, is this printmaking? Is this painting? It's something in between for sure. Okay, so we saw what relief printing is through the printing press. We saw how letters are used to print books or were used before the digital age. This was also used in not only making books, but a lot of imagery. You can use wood blocks with multiple colors, where you might have several blocks, you register them all, and then you print them with different inks to get multiple colors. In intaglio, you have several kinds of intaglio. So this is where you're going to cut into generally like copper or some soft metal, and engraving money is made from engraving. And then you put the ink inside of the grooves and you squeeze it. And then you also have things like uh, etching, which is using acids. And the acid is eating into the plate. Similar process for photogravure as well. So when it comes to engraving, probably some of the greatest engravings ever made were made by Albrecht Durer. Uh, this is St. Jerome in his study from 1514. So this is made by cutting very, very small lines into soft metal 
and then printing them with pieces of paper, usually numbered to tell you how many that you're making and whether this is one out of 25, five out of 25. Generally, the earlier in the set, the more valuable because it's a crisper image. What I love about Dewar and how masterful his engravings are is he's able to get, by putting lines next to each other, the closer the lines are, the blacker the shadow is. The more space there is between the lines or the hatching lines, if you remember from our drawing lecture, the more gray they are. So he's able to achieve light gray, mid gray, a, really a full range of values with this New Testament saint, Saint Jerome, who was hand copying Bibles. We also see the skull here as a kind of vanitas that we have seen in several lectures. Uh, the lion was from a tale how he, in his uh, preaching and evangelizing, he came across the baby lion, took a uh, thorn out of its paw. Then when he was captured by the Romans and was going to be put to death for being Christian, this lion was there to eat him, recognized him as his benefactor, cuddled up to him, and the Romans thought this was big magic, and they let Jerome and they let the lion go. What I think is really interesting about this image is I don't think Dewar ever saw a real lion because the lion really has the face of a kitten more so than an actual lion. And I guess, you know, if you were going to describe what a lion was to someone who'd never seen it, you might describe it simply as a really large kitty or a large cat. And that's kind of what this looks like. I want to show you a video with an engraving so you get some idea of how process heavy this is. So this is an engraver who works at the Rhode Island School of Design. He is copying an image on tracing paper. Then he's going to take copper and put wax on the copper. Then he puts the tracing paper over it and he pushes the lines that he made into the wax to create an impression. Once he has that impression, then he uses a steel to a burin to then get the outlines to get the impression. And then he's going to put on his jeweler's glass so he can really get up close to this. The process of it is, is you don't turn your hand, you turn the copper to make the curves. And then he does all of the hatching and cross hatching, cutting out little pieces of copper as he goes. So he gets this very nice impression here. Now that we have the matrix, now you go in and you ink then your matrix, covering it with ink, and then the process of getting the ink all off of the copper plate, except for the ink that is in the grooves that were made. So it's a laborious, lengthy process, but you can see now we have the copper plate pretty clean, now it's time for the paper. You wet the paper. You put the engraving under it. And then you use this press whose technology probably has not changed in 500 years. And then you get a image. And you can see, really nice image, really well done. And then if you want to make a second or a third or a fourth, you have to repeat, repeat that process of inking it, taking the ink off, and putting it through the press. So it's not like when you're using an inkjet printer and you want 30 copies and it just prints 30 copies. It is, it is a much more laborious process. Dry point is a, uh, another kind of similar way of, of doing a intaglio print. In mezzotint, what you do is you rough up the copper first and then you smooth it out. So it's kind of kind of backwards. It's a process. In etching, etching you're using coats of acid and then you're resisting it in areas with beeswax or other materials. So it only eats out certain sections. And again, to make Black. So to probably get it black, you're probably putting it in the acid bath two or three times. In the light gray, maybe putting it in once. And then the white spaces, you're keeping that um, ground, that resistance the entire time. 
Another variation of etching is aquatint that, again, you can see here the kind of grayscale that happens from one minute in the acid bath, three minute, five minute, and it makes really nice, smooth, planar relationships rather than the linear relationships that you would get from etching small lines into it. And I love this Goya here uh, titled, So Was His Father. Uh, I think it's <laughs> very, very funny. Photogravure is also using the kind of printing process where you're using a way of burning into your matrix from photographic processes to create photographic images. And again, it's a very complex process to burn that image into the copper plate. But once that is burned in through the acids, you can then start printing it, a number of them for magazines and such. Lithography is a way of painting directly onto a stone and then using a series of processes to print it. Here is a short video on it, and I think it does a really good job very quickly kind of describing how it works. He works on the chemical principle that grease and water repel each other. All work remains on the surface. There is no carving. The artist marks the stone with greasy crayons and then covers it with a thin film of water. When the ink is applied, it is attracted only to the greasy image and repelled by the water, which fills the other areas of the stone. And then once you have that inked, it's then very easy then to put a piece of paper on it and to make a print out of it. So these videos I'm showing you, they are all on the lecture. I have links to all of them. Uh, the majority of them, the links are good as far as I know. Certainly the ones I'm showing you in the lecture are good. Now, lithography is something that artists who draw and paint really liked when it became available as an option in the mid-1800s. And when we think about uh, Lautrec and Art Nouveau, those are the types of posters that are done with lithography. Because again, it's really direct in terms of drawing on the stone rather than carving it with little lines like engraving does or with acid. With screen printing, probably something all of you have in your home right now. I'm sure you have t-shirts or something that have been screen printed. So the screen is made from using UV light, and then you put an image on the screen, and then you have that image then burnt in with light, and then once it's burnt in, you clean it off, and then once you clean it off, so this, the, the, the letters here, that is going through the screen. And what that means is, is when we get the screen ready to print, we can lay here in this, they're laying a, what looks like a t-shirt down. Then they put the screen on top of it with ink that kind of is thick like paint rather than watery or runny. And then you can see then how it is smoothed on. And then when you lift up the, uh, the screen, all you have to do is dry it. And then once it's dried, boom, you got a t-shirt. So... Screen printing is something that we saw Andy Warhol doing from an earlier lecture. This is Ed Ruscha here. So with screen prints, you can make them fairly easily. They, the screens hold up for a long time, so you can make a number of prints. And that's certainly what Andy Warhol was doing. One of the things Andy was also innovating was when he had, say, a screen that had multiple colors. This one looks like it's two colors, the flesh color and the black color, maybe a third color for the lightness of the hair here. So when here you're using three different screens rather than one because you're covering them in ink, right? So it'd be hard to cover part of it in ink. So as you're putting the screens down, normally in a t-shirt when you do that, you have registration little X's and you make sure they register perfectly. 
Andy often is misregistering the work. You can see where the outline here doesn't fit into the flesh color. So in other words, this misregistering would be rejected by the commercial world, and that rejection from the commercial world, I think, is one of the things that makes it avant-garde and makes it art rather than just a t-shirt. You can also make single prints from simply putting wet paint onto a matrix and then pushing paper onto it, and you could do it with multiple colors as long as you allow that print to dry. Of course, inkjet printing is made from uh, the processes of static electricity and how static electricity will jump from a toner hopper uh, onto paper and then it can be dried. I have a five minute video here that shows you exactly how an inkjet works. You might find it kind of fascinating. And then probably the most interesting printing going on right now is 3D printing where you can use a computer program and a printer and the printer will not print just on a flat piece of paper but will print something three-dimensionally and depending on how big the printer is you can print really big things you can print in color you can print moving objects and i have a video probably now that's about 10 or 15 years old that shows you early 3d printing processes and then I thought this was kind of cool if you were interested in this. This is printing skin from using skin cells, growing the skin cells, and then putting the skin cells into an inkjet printer. And then that inkjet printer is able to measure where the skin is missing on a burn victim and print skin onto maybe skin that might save somebody's life or help them to regrow skin. It's pretty interesting, I think, how they hacked into a regular inkjet printer and came up with this idea. I'm always into people hacking devices and then using those devices beyond their uh, original intentions. Okay. So, kind of short lecture here. So for this assignment, you are going to take a quiz. You're also going to do an assessment. What part of the lecture did you like best? Question number one, and then Tell me four things that you learned from the lecture. And then we will continue next with photography and film. I'll talk to you soon.